welcome to the Sonoma Plaza. We're so glad you could join us today. This is really your neighborhood, isn't it? It really is. I love it here. Love it here. If you come to wine country and it doesn't make you feel romantic, you're not doing it right. Ralph Dimici here, Wine Country at Work. Today we're at one of my favorite places in California, the historic Sonoma Plaza. That's how it's always described, the historic Sonoma Plaza. And yet, most people have no idea of why it's historic. It is the largest plaza in California, admittedly, and it is also the home of one of the missions, the 21st mission, but it goes beyond that. It's a complex of ingredients that come together to make this place really quite special. Sonoma is one of the top wine destinations in the world. And the plaza is a big ingredient of that. Samuele Sebastiani, who opened his winery here in 1906, built this theater. Part of his plan was to convince the town to rename it from Sonoma to Sebastiani. But it didn't work out that way. It's a lot of history here, but it's still a current and vital town. For instance, this little section of the street when they made the movie Bottle Shock was used to depict Paris. And it served quite well in that purpose. Everyone uses the plaza, from ducks to families, to events, to school groups. Even in the middle of the winter when it's cold out, you always seem to be able to find a rose or two on the plaza. And of course there at the center, the jewel. The building behind me, that's the town hall. It's just over 100 years old. It's identical on all four sides because the shopkeepers, well, they paid for it. None of them want to look at the back. It sits in the middle of nine acres of beautiful parkland, and the entire town revolves around this plaza. You can see it's just about noontime, and it's got full sun on the face of that building. Why? Because the face of that building set, faces due south almost exactly true south. It's built basically in the same way that they would plan out a, a town or an, even an army camp back in Roman times. It's very practical. Here it's got the mountains to the north, it's got the water to the south, the north parts of the San Pablo Bay. They would describe that arrangement as being really good feng shui because it protects you from the cold north winds, it allows the sun to bounce off the water to the south and light up the sky and keep you warm. The duck pond is a favorite among families, especially those with young children. In fact, the plaza has numerous water features spread out over its nine acres. For a long time, the plaza was a bit of a wreck all the way up into the beginning of the 1900s, but then the Women's Club of Sonoma adopted the plaza, started working on beautifying it, planting these trees that now, a hundred years later, are such a tremendous resource. Now this little jewel, this has its own story, and it's a very important part of the history and current life of the town. This building behind us was at one time a library. It was a gift from Andrew Carnegie, or Carnegie if you're from Pittsburgh. He gave libraries to prominent towns throughout the country, and Sonoma in the North Bay was the most prominent town. It's a beautiful example of the architecture, very graceful, and today it serves as the visitor center. But it gives you a sense of the weight that Sonoma had in the history of California.
When people are part of a town, they want to contribute to it. And the Sebastiani Theater, of course, contributes a lot. But it also speaks to the Italian tradition in Sonoma, a place where many Italians first settled in the 1800s. This is the Italian fountain, put together by an Italian organization. And it's a beautiful place because it's surrounded by roses. Of course, what would a park be without playgrounds? And the Sonoma Plaza has two large playgrounds for two different age groups. One of the wonderful things about the Sonoma Plaza, which is so true in wine country, is that it's very social. It's a great place to get together. And in fact, you can actually drink wine on the plaza. So many families will take over a picnic table and all the generations will arrive and people can have their food and enjoy their wine and the children can go off and play on the playground. In fact, our family does that many times when we're having a big event. Everyone can meet there and it's delightful. We see so many other families doing it as well. This is the northeastern corner of the plaza. And you can see there the statue, the monument for the bear flag. 1846, instead of children and men, fathers playing here, it would have been a group of bear flaggers with their weapons raising up their flag, declaring the new Republic of California. Quite an event that many people don't know happened here. Of course, it was only a republic for about six weeks before it became part of the United States. But it was still a republic. Here we start getting into some of the serious history about the Sonoma Plaza. Off there to my left, that's the mission, San Francisco Solano. It was actually named Solano to differentiate it from the one in San Francisco. Solano was actually the name of one of the um, Indians who served and lived at the mission for many years. To my other side, that's the fort, the Presidio. This was the northern fort, the northernmost fort of the Spanish Empire in the Americas. It was in charge of everything north of, of the Golden Gate Pass, no bridge at the time, and it was controlled primarily by General Mariano Guadalupe Vallejo. So we have the 21st and final mission. We have the final Presidio right next door to each other. The mission actually was originally further south down on the what would be today the Klein Estate, the Klein Winery. It was a little closer to Carneros, but it was moved up here later on. The Presidio, the fort, these were the barracks for the soldiers, have a lot to do with why the plaza is so large. You have to have a place to drill the troops. Makes perfect sense, yes? It was General Vallejo who laid out the plaza with the help of an English sailor who I think married one of his children. In many ways, he was more responsible for California becoming part of the United States than anyone and for a very simple reason. He had been told by Mexico City not to let the Americans in. They were the illegal aliens, and if they showed up, send them packing. But he ignored them. Why? Because there were not enough people there to settle the land. He had all this land to give away and he didn't have people to fill it up. Even in Mexico, they didn't have enough people to work the land. So when he met Americans who were arriving, and they uh, were hardworking and industrious and good people, he looked the other way. The population grew larger and larger, especially on the other side of the mountains in Napa, which was a river town. It's one of the big differences between Napa and Sonoma is that Napa is a river town where Sonoma you reach by land. It's 10 miles from the plaza down to the Embarcadero. Of course, it was a pretty straight line because you had to march your troops down there sometimes. (laughs) 
over my shoulder that way, that's the Toscana Hotel. That was one of the places where a lot of the original uh, settlers stayed when they first got here. A lot of Italians, obviously, but Toscana. A lot of Sonoma was settled by Italians and had a big influence on the wine world later on, of course, because when they arrived here, that was one of their dominant industries, that and quarries. Sonoma was the heart of a lot of quarries that provided the stone for building San Francisco. A big part of the northern part of the plaza, and we're on the northeastern corner, is State Park because of the history here. I mean, after all, this is the historic spot. This is the 21st mission. This is the final Presidio. And within California, to be historic, the third component is that it should be a Pueblo or an official city. You see, it's not like other parts of the country where on the East Coast where there was a battle, you know, blood was spilled or some treaty was signed. It's not like that. Here it has to do with people getting along well. And a Pueblo is part of that. It means being an official city. And Sonoma was one of the six official Pueblos. It, in fact, is the only town that was a Pueblo, a Presidio, and a Mission in all of California. That alone would make it the most his historic spot. But there's more. When they laid out the town, it has that very Latin feeling, which means there's lots of little passageways and courtyards to walk down and get out of the sun. And it can get very bright here, so those overhangs and hidden walkways are very important to people's comfort. And of course, water. In such a dry place, fountains are very important to help people stay cool. This area gets no snowfall, really. It has a lot more warm days than cold days. So it had that Latin feeling without the blistering heat you find further south. All around the plaza are wonderful little shops and courtyards that you can wander into. Some wonderful old adobes from the early days. And they've respected the architecture. Uh, all around the plaza, there, there are no chain restaurants. Everything is kept very much mom and pop operations. Right there over my shoulder was the Commandant's house. Now back in the day, that was General Vallejo. Right? His younger brother was Salvador. General Vallejo was greatly beloved, partly because he got Salvador to do a lot of the dirty work. People didn't like Salvador so much, but they loved General Vallejo. Well, because he lived right there, and the barracks were right there. When things started to change in 1846, when so many Americans had come to the area and they decided that they wanted to separate from Mexico and become part of the United States, they first had to declare themselves independent. They actually declared themselves an independent republic, the independent republic of California. Well, where did they do that? Well, a lot of the people who did this came from Sacramento and then other ones came from Napa. Napa was a river town, so a lot of Americans had settled there. Sacramento was another river town, and a lot of, a lot of the shipping along the West Coast was controlled by Americans, these uh, New England sea captains. And a lot of them came up and settled there. Where Sonoma was different, Sonoma was landlocked. Uh, you go about 10 miles to the south of here, straight down Broadway, which is due south, it brings you to what they call their embarcadero, their docks, which was right up on the bay, but it was, you know, 10 miles down. In Napa, the river goes right through the middle of the town, just like in Sacramento. So a lot of Americans in those areas, and they decided that they were worried about being chased out, so instead they would take the place over. So the people in Sacramento 
gathered up weapons, and then they came to Napa and gathered up more people. And the whole thing was kind of instigated by President Polk, actually, who sent a military surveying team down here from Oregon to stir things up. And they came to the plaza, and they came right out here to this corner, and they raised the bear flag. The bear flag is sent down to the city of Sonoma's flag. It's also the state flag. And they raised it here on the plaza, and they actually took General Vallejo prisoner for six months, though I suspect he kind of invited them back to his house for wine and beer later, because later on he still had a lot of power. He actually still was able to give land grants that was still in place, because all the land had been given to him, and then he gave it out to people or sold it. And later on, he was a state senator. So like I said, people like General Vallejo. So there was his house. This whole corner up here was part of the history, or it's part of the history of California. Now just past the house, the, to the left there, that was the servants' quarters. Very low doorways, little windows, but that was the servants' quarters. I guess you needed a lot of servants in those days. Didn't have a lot of automation. But there's still more to this place. It's kind of remarkable. There's still more. It's funny that the bear flag was raised on what is today Flag Day. Great coincidence. On the weekends, the whole plaza fills up with people from the whole Bay Area. Now, while all these people were making history, they still had to have a place to get a, you know, a drink and a sandwich, right? Well, General Vallejo built the Blue Wing Inn about 1840. It was a hotel, a restaurant, a bar, whatever you needed to be, a store, and many, many famous people stayed here over the years because even after it became part of the United States, this became the headquarters for the United States military north of the bay. So, for instance, General Grant, um, William T. Sherman, Fighting Joe Hooker, famous Civil War general who later lived here, lived here before the Civil War and came back as a commandant after the Civil War. Uh, one of the most notorious was a bandit named Murrieta and Three-Fingered Jack. It's amazing that this building has not been restored. It's a huge amount of work, honestly, and it's in remarkably good condition considering that it's made out of adobe. But this climate here really stands up to it, and right across the way, is the mission, San Francisco Solano. If you're ever here, you should really visit the mission. It's quite beautiful inside. It's very elegant, which many of the old missions are. When you come to Sonoma, when you come to wine country, you need to allow a certain amount of time just to go wandering around the plaza. I mean, this is the largest plaza in California. There's nooks and crannies and stores and restaurants and interesting shops and galleries everywhere. So take your time and wander around. Sample the chocolates. Try the wine. Have a bite to eat. I mean, one of the great joys of life, after all, is shopping. And there's very few places that do it quite as gracefully as the Sonoma Plaza. And of course, there's always more history because that's Sonoma. This was the home of General Joseph Hooker, Fightin' Joe. He actually had come here before the Civil War uh, as an entrepreneur, was not especially successful at it. But then the war broke out. He went back and rose up to the ranks to general and became a very well-known hero of the Civil War. He was very dashing, very good-looking. And the story is that there were a lot of camp followers who followed his troops around and they became known as Hooker's Girls. 
In truth, the term hooker predates Fightin' Joe. But he came out here and was the commandant for a long time. And there's some wonderful stories about, for instance, one of his friends came out, been another officer during the Civil War, and came out with basically a horse and the clothes on his back and said, Joe, can you help me out? And he said, no problem. Well, go see General Vallejo. Get him to give you some land. Because General Vallejo was the one who was in charge of the land. It went back to the original Spanish land grants that then became part of Mexico, and then the Republic of Mexico. And when it became part of the United States, that system was still in place. So they went to see General Vallejo, and he gave him what is essentially today Point Reyes, where the big racetrack is, all the way down at the bay. And that was Joe Hooker's friend's Reyes. So lots of great stories, and, and they helped get this place onto a firm footing for many years to come because, like I said, so much of what happens north of the bay revolves around Sonoma in one way or another. Well, that's it for Wine Country at Work. Thanks for joining us. And remember, if you come to Wine Country and you're not feeling relaxed, you're not doing it right.